Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Spark AI Summit 2020. The layout is a little different this year. The summit is virtual, but we hope everybody is still having a great time at the summit. Before we begin, let's have a brief introduction round. My name is Anurag Tangri, and I work for Visa. And I also have my colleague, Jan Hua Huang, join me today, who will introduce himself shortly. At Visa, we both work for a team called Visa Research. Visa Research conducts fundamental and applied research into a number of use cases to build new market opportunities and business opportunities for Visa. Visa Research focuses in the area of AI and security. We are a pretty unique group at Visa in terms of the work we do. We are not always constrained by product deliverables and timelines as we explore a broad array of technologies and use cases. Some of that might never result in products, while others have a very meaningful impact for Visa. Today, we wanna to welcome you to our talk of using AI to support proliferating merchant changes. Specifically, we wanna talk about the changes to merchants in the dynamic payment ecosystem and how we are using AI to detect those changes in time and accurately. So with that, let's dive right in. So here's the agenda for today's talk. So we're gonna talk about introduction to Visa and we'll have VisaNet basics. So VisaNet is our payment network. And then we'll go to our topic for today's talk, which is merchant entity recognition, in short, MER. So we'll talk about how merchant changes in the payment ecosystem and how we are using AI to detect the merchant changes. Specifically, we have two modeling approaches for the problem. The first one is called feature similarity based on similarity between merchant profiles. And if the merchant profile changes dramatically, then we choose the second approach, which is called consumer behavior, and it's a complementary approach for the problem. So I will be covering the first approach, and my colleague Jan Hua will cover the second approach. And then we look at some key observations, followed by Q&A. So here's a quick disclaimer. So all statistics, research, recommendations provided today are for informational purposes. Visa does not assume any responsibility or liability that might arise from using this information. So with that, let's look at who is Visa. We are a global payments technology company that enables digital payments. We work with a wide variety of financial institutions, governments, consumers to enable financial inclusion. Visa is one of the most common forms of payments available worldwide. And let's also talk about who we are not. So we are not credit card issuers. We are not a bank or a lender. So that's the most common misconception that people have. And then we are not exposed to consumer credit risk. So with that, we wanted to show you how a transaction flows to our payment network. Before we do that, let's take a look at four parties involved here. So on the right, you see issuer and a card holder. Uh, issuer is a bank that issues cards to people like you and me. And on the left, you see merchant and an acquirer. A merchant here could be a grocery store or a restaurant or a clothing store that we visit on a regular basis. And merchants in turn have their own bank too, which is called acquirer. So for that, that background, let's see the journey of a transaction. So it all begins with a card. You are at a merchant location and ready to check out. At that point, you will swipe or tap your card. The merchant will further send that request to the acquirer. An acquirer will send it to Visa. So at that point, transaction has entered VisaNet, which is the network built and maintained by Visa. Visa will further forward that request to the issuer. And the issuer will look at the cardholder's details and provide a response in terms of approval or denial. And the request flows back in the same way from issuer to VisaNet to acquirer and finally to the merchant. And at that point, you have an approval for the request. And all this happens while you are waiting at the merchant's terminal. So we see that Visa Nets always makes sure that the transaction is processed securely and promptly. And here we see some statistics about our Visa Net. So we have 3.5 billion Visa cards, 7.8 billion people. So it's one is to two ratio. And Visa Net processes 180 billion transactions every year. So that gives you an idea of the scale and the massiveness of the data set that we have. So this it's itself is a big challenge as an opportunity for a data scientist like us to work on this data day in and day out. And with that, we wanna talk about our topic for today, which is merchant entity recognition. In short, we'll call it MER. 
So here you wanted to demonstrate the merchant acquirer relationship over time. So at time T0, we see a merchant come in our system with the name ABC and an acquirer bank A, and it gets an ID assigned to it, which is MER ID 1. Further, at time T1, the merchant might decide to change his acquirer bank. And at that time, it might have a new name and a new acquirer bank and gets a new ID assigned in our system. Further, we see at time T3, the merchant might decide to go back to the old acquirer, which is the acquirer bank A in this case, and might again have a different name. So this shows that how merchant is changing entity in our system, and then we don't have a direct relationship with merchant. So a lot of this data we are getting is through our VisaNet data, and we are trying to build this relationship. So, so this brings us to the problem statement for today that merchants are constantly moving acquirers in our system and they are showing up as new merchants. So how do we link those new merchants to existing merchant entities in our system that have just changed their entity in the system? So if we are able to do that, we have a lot of benefits of this linking. Some of them listed here on the screen. The first one being the efficient management of merchant offers. We can overqualify or underqualify the offers based on how merchant has changed. And then we can have a coherent merchant information over time for our risk management systems. And it also helps preventing the bad players from using the system. And then we can also profile our merchants based on their time on file. Time on file is when we see the merchant for the first time, and then we can create their peer groups. So with that, we want to talk about the first approach, which is the merchant feature similarity approach. So here we have the process flow. So we talk about first the merchant ID creations. We look at our authorization data, then create our MER IDs. And at the end of it, we have a merchant ID database where we are creating these IDs. So essentially we create the merchant and we enrich them. And here then you see the merchant tracking. So here we start with the list of disappeared merchants which you see in the middle says day n. And we calculate that disappeared merchants by starting at day minus n. And in this case, it is seven days prior, looking at the merchant's activity. And at the day n, we are able to say that out of those active merchants, these many merchants have disappeared. And then you see that at that point, at day n, our linking process gets started. And every day, we try to do this linking. And at the end of it, we are able to say how many of these merchants are linked and how many are unlinked. And the reason we do a daily linking for M number of days is because a lot of times we see that when merchants come back in our system, they might take time to bring the volume back to the new acquirer. So this uh, window concept really helps us in that case. And, and towards the right, you see what all uh, is happening in our merchant tracking system. So first thing we are using is something called LSH algorithm. And we're gonna talk about that in the next slides. And we are using Apache Spark ML Libs implementation for that. And then we also look at our merchant location. So once LSH algorithm results in our uh, appropriate at our um, merchants, then we look at the merchant location and then we look at their volume shift. And then we also look at their name similarity and many more. So with that, Let's take a brief look at how LSH algorithm works. So LSH stands for locality sensitive hashing. So this algorithm is based on the principle that if two points are close to each other in high dimensional space, then they're close to each other in lower dimensional space also. For example, here you see two red spheres in figure A, which are very close to each other. So if you look at those points from another dimension as in figure B, they are still close to each other. And same stands true for these two green cubes, which are very far apart from each other. And further, when we project these points in a low dimensional space, if they are close to each other, they will be close to each other in the lower dimensional space also. And LSH also further does something called random projections, which really add to the probability of doing random projections from high dimensional to lower space and getting a very high probability match. So with that LSH uh, introduction, we wanted to show how our merchant profile vector looks like. So here you see on the left uh, merchant name, which are three coffee shops in three different geographies. And then we'll take our transaction counts and we try to build a transaction pattern from this transaction count. So we look at the transaction and split them by hours of the day. So zero to third hour, four to sixth hour. And as you can see here, you see a very unique pattern for UK transactions and New York will come further in the day and their transaction will be concentrated in different times of the day and same for San Francisco. So this gives us a very unique way of localizing the merchants in a geography. 
Further, we add some amount-based features. So here you see transaction amount, and then we have average ticket size, which is the amount that consumers are spending at that location. And then we have some percentiles for amounts. And further, we also add country-based counts. So here you can see that UK has country code 826, so the counts went there. And for US, we have country code 840, so New York City and San Francisco counts end up there. The next set of counts that we add is channel-based counts. So here you can see bill pay, e-com. E-com stands for e-commerce and online transactions. Moto is mail order, telephone order. And then we have face-to-face. -face. So in this case, all these transactions happen at the merchant location. So the counts end up in face-to-face -face category. And then towards the further right, you see something called MCC counts. So MCC stands for merchant category code. So here we have different merchants like restaurants or clothing stores or groceries. They all have their own codes. And here we are just encoding those MCC counts. So now when you look at this entire profile, you can see that we can represent merchant profiles for UK merchants in a very specific way using their transaction pattern, their amounts, their country codes, channels, and MCC, which really helps us in localizing the results from the algorithm. So with that, now let's look at how LSH algorithm works in our case. So here on the left, you will see the merchants profile vectors that we just looked at. And these are the merchant vectors um, that are the new merchants that appeared in our system. So you can see that merchant two, M3, and M4 have very similar merchant profiles. So when they run through the algorithm, the model will assign them hash values which are very close to each other, and they will end up in one bucket. Similarly, merchant M1 and M5 they have a very similar merchant profile and they will end up with the similar hash values in a different bucket. And now when we find our missing merchant, which is at the top called merchant Q, you can see that their merchant profile looks very similar to merchant one and merchant five. And in this case, LSH algorithm will assign them in the same bucket. And then on top of that, we use our further um, matching techniques like merchant location, merchant name, which helps us in getting a very high probability match of the missing merchant to the new merchant. So this is how LSH algorithm is uh, able to work very well in our scenario. So now let's look at some performance analysis. So if we look at time complexity for a merchant of, com sorry, for a collection of N merchants, the com time complexity for linear comparison would be order of N square. For example, if we have 1 million merchants, we might end up doing 10 to the power 12 comparisons, which is a lot and time consuming and we have scalability issues. Versus when we use the Apache Spark implementation of LSH, it can be done in sublinear time. And similarly, when we look at space complexity, if we try to store our entire merchant vector, as you remember, it was 1,000 plus fields, if we try to bring it in memory, it's going to be a very big memory overhead during runtime. Versus when we use LSH model, we are only storing the hash values, which is the low dimensional projection of those merchant vectors in the memory, and which really helps us in the space complexity issue. So we can see that with using the Spark MLlib implementation of LSH algorithm, we can run this process at big scale and in sublinear time. So now we want to talk about some model results. So here we have a major clothing store in California. So we start monitoring the merchant on 11th of January 2020. On 17th of January, we found the merchant to be disappeared. So at that point, our linking model starts and on Next day, we are able to find that the missing merchant is, has a new acquirer and our model is able to successfully link it. So here we have another example, which is a popular fast food chain in Florida. So again, we started monitoring the merchant on 8th of January, 2019. On 14th, we found that merchant is disappeared. Our linking kicks in. First day, we did not find it, but the next day we are able to find the match and we are able to link the missing merchant. Another example here is an e-commerce merchant based out of Georgia. So here on 12th of January, 2019, we started monitoring the merchant mm -hmm. and on 18th, we found the merchant to be disappeared. So then our linking process started kicked uh, on 19th of January and you can see it continued for next number of days. In our case, we are using a window time of seven days and the end of the seventh day on 25th, we were able to link the merchant. 
And this ties back to our original description where we saw in our process flow that when a merchant has a new acquirer, it might take time to bring it volume back to the new acquirer. And this is where this window concept really helps us in linking those kind of merchants. And then we also wanted to show a case where our model is not able to find the merchant. So this is a gas station in New York. So we started monitoring on 9th of January and on 15th, we found the merchant to be disappeared. And again, we do the linking process day by day. And at the end of seventh day, we still could not find the merchant. And when we looked at it, this merchant was permanently closed. So which was a uh, right um, scenario for our model to not find it because the merchant is closed. So now we wanted to just take a quick look at the statistics from this model. So here we had the model input of 120,000 US merchants, which were tracked for a week. And here you see the disabled date on the, in the first column. And second column is the number of the missing merchants. So every day we found those many merchants to be missing. And then in orange, you see how linking was kicked in every day and, at, and every day, how many merchants were able to link. And at the end of it, we can say how many of the missing merchants were linked and how many were not linked, which were not found by a model. And then you see another category called came back. And this is again, the same category where we see that merchants keeps on moving their volumes from one acquirer to another. And sometimes for some reason they will move them and then we see that coming back after some time. So combinedly, if you see total linked and came back percentages, so we can see at the end, we were able to achieve about 80% linkage from this model, which was very good results from this particular model. And with that, uh, I want to um, invite my colleague Chan Hua to cover the next complementary approach for this model. Um, so over to you, Chan Hua. Yes, thanks, Enra. So this is Chan Hua, and I'm also a data scientist in Visa Research. I'll take over this presentation to talk about the second approach, which is based on the consumer behavior. So just to refresh you about the first approach, I'll talk about the um, feature similarity approach briefly. So using this feature similarity approach, we can check whether two merchants are the same by comparing their features. If these features are very similar to each other, we can say these two merchants are in fact one merchant. This approach works well if the feature only changes slightly. However, if the feature changes dramatically, for example, the parent company change for the merchant, as a result, the name, the, the merchant time, and acquirer bank, all of those things can change. So in this case, the feature similarity approach may not work well. So in order to overcome this problem, we decide a new approach, which is based on the consumer behavior. Instead of tracking the merchant features, we track the customers that are strongly connected to the merchant. Then based on the behavior of the, this strongly connected cons consumer, we can decide whether this merchant is closed or the ID is changed. This approach is based on three important assumptions. The first assumption is that the merchant ID change has no impact to the customer's shopping behavior because the customers, they don't even know what are the IDs saved in the visa system. The second assumption is that the consistent customers will keep going to the same merchant. And the last assumption is that diverse customers will switch to different merchants when a merchant is closed. In order for this approach to work, we need to define consistent and diverse customers precisely. So let's first have a look at the definition for consistent customer. So here consistent is used to define the behavior for individuals. Here we define consistency as individuals who visit a merchant repeatedly and frequently. So in this slide, we see six different scenarios, so in different consistency. In the first scenario, the customer visits the store every day, which is the most consistent. And as a contrast, in the last scenario, the customers visit the merchant randomly, which means that we cannot expect whether those customers will come back again. So if we can identify some consistent customer, we can track their behavior and see whether the merchant is close or not. Next, let's have a look at the definition for diverse customer. So diverse here is to use to decry the behavior for a group of, of a customers. So in these tables, we, we saw three different customers and they all went to a different store except the common store T. So in this case, if the merchant T is closed, 
then these customers will probably replace T with different versions, for example, version X, Y, and Z. And in another scenario, if the merchant ID is changed, in this case, because the, these customers are consistent customers, they will still keep going back to the same version, regardless the ID has been changed from T to N. So with diverse customer, we can differentiate these two different scenarios when the merchant T is closed or when the merchant ID is changed. So now we are clear about the definition for consistent and diverse customers. Next, use an example to show you how we can identify such customers. Next, assume that the merchant T disappear in the visa system on day N. Then we can extract the historical data between day N minor 90 and day N. Then we can define a series of rules to extract the consistent customers. For example, the customer one with the merchant T every day, customer two with LD after day, and customer three with LD Monday. With this, we can further extract the um, diverse customers. So in order to identify the diverse customers, we use the JK index, which is compared against the intersection of the stores, both C1 and C2 listed, divided by the union of the stores C1 and C2 listed. For example, if C1 is the red and green store, and C2 is the green and blue stores. So the intersection will be the green store and the union will be red, green, and blue store. Uh, as a result, the JK index between C1 and C2 will be one over three. So using the JK index, we can calculate the correlations between all pairs of the customers and show it as the table on the left-hand side. So as you can see in this table, the diagonal value is always one because it shows the JK index or similarity between the same customer. So if we look at the similarity between C1 and all other customers, we can see the JK index between C1 and C6 is very high. The value is 0.9, which means that these two customers has they have very similar shopping pattern in the past, in the past. So they may be from the same family. In this case, we want to either remove C1 or C6. Similarly, the check index between C2 and C5 is also very high. So in this case, we want to remove either C2 or C5. So at the end, we will only keep a diverse customers who used to visit different merchants. So with this consistent and diverse customers, we, we can then track their behavior after the merchant T dis disappear in visa system. Here, we saw two different scenarios. The first scenario is the, is the merchant T is closed. And the second scenario is the merchant ID has been changed from T to F. As we discussed in earlier slide, if the merchant is closed because the customers are diverse, they will replace the merchant T with different merchants. And as a result, if we look at the daily list based on C1, C2, and C3, we can see they prefer to go to different stores. And if the merchant ID is changed, then because the, the customers are consistent, they will keep visiting the same merchant without even knowing that the merchant ID has been changed from T to N. So as a result, in research system, we will see lots of transactions for this consistent and I was customers appearing in the new merchant ID N. So based on these two scenario, we can further decide a method to identify whether the merchant is closed or ID is changed. Here we saw two different scenario again, and the gray color bars represent the historical daily visit to the target merchant team based on 100 selected, consistent, and diverse customers. And as you can see, the daily visit is um, very close to 100 in most of the days, and the range is about 89 to 100. And the vertical lines here represent the daily customer visit to different merchants after merchant T disappear. So in the first scenario, if the merchant T is closed, we can see the customer will move to different merchants, for example, AXFC, none of the daily visit to these merchants fall within the historical range. And most of these merchants probably are all merchants. And in contrast, if the merchant ID has been changed from T to N, the customers will keep visiting the same merchant and a new merchant ID N with similar daily visit, which is within the historical range will be detected. So using this method, we can see two different scenarios that 
they have very different uh, daily risk value. And based on that, we can detect whether the motion is closed or ID change. And this method can, in fact, be further extended to new motion recommendation. So just imagine that we can keep tracking the royal customer for the merchant team, right? And in some day, when a new merchant N appear, some of the new loyal customers will probably switch to the new merchant N. And with day passing, more and more loyal customers will switch to N. So at the end, most of the loyal customers, they don't visit T again, and they keep visiting N frequently. So in this case, we can say the new merchant N is probably better than the old merchant T. So now we can recommend the new machine learning to other customers. Thus, this second approach is still at this early stage. And due to the time limit, we, we don't want to cover too much about the results. And with that, we, we can conclude this presentation. So first, we would like to highlight that these two approaches are highly complementary to each other. If the feature changed dramatically, we probably would like to use the consumer behavior approach. If the consumer warrant and the data availability is kind of limited, then in this case, we probably want to use the feature similarity approach. Further, we would like to say that both model approach can be extended to other fields. For example, the feature similarity can be extended to um, for spelling correction. And the consumer behavior approach can be extended to merchant recommendation. And we, we also like to address that, in fact, the consumer behavior-based approach can be used for any kind of entity tracking, as long as that we can develop the uh, network between the target entity and the connected entity. For example, we can track whether um, a new credit card is linked to an old credit card because the old credit card just expired, or whether a phone number is linked to an old uh, phone number because the um, phone number holder just move to a new place and whether a new account can be linked to a, an old account and so on. And with that, um, I think this is the all presentation for uh, the merchant entity tracking. Thank you very much and any questions is welcome.